Okay. Um, so I just want to make sure that folks know that uh, this is the third webinar. I'm Julie Lemoyne. I'm going to moderate this one. I've got a lot of years in all this, but I'm going to skip past my introduction. You can look me up on the website. Um, but uh, we're a very new organization, so I just want to take a quick second and say um, we are all about sharing and developing knowledge around the use of augmented virtual and mixed reality, and our mission is to build this community. Uh, this webinar is a part of a, a whole year long that we're working on to lead up to our 2021 a symposium and hackathon. Um, and uh, let me just tell you that nothing like this gets done without some sponsors. So I'd be really remiss if I didn't sort of shout out to the sponsors uh, before I bring uh, Skip on. So I just wanted to, to say thank you to the sponsors. And if anyone's interested in that, uh, we want to make sure that you get in touch with us. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to skip some of this other stuff. But um, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Skip Rizzo. Uh, Dr. Rizzo is the director of the Medical Virtual Reality Institute for Creative Technologies and Research. He is also a professor at UC Davis, J Davis's school. Uh, Dr. Rizzo is a world leading neurobehavioral scientist and a luminary for anybody that does not know Dr. Rizzo's work. Uh, he's been leading the field for so many years. Uh, today, he's going to talk a little bit about his groundbreaking work in XR research and development and also about how uh, it's gone out of the lab and making impact today. And then we're going to ask him to share some more realities about the transition of uh, academic research and how you get it into action in the field. Uh, today's talk, and I'm really zooming here, folks, to get him up there, but we are going to have questions and answers at the end. Um, and I'll moderate that. And and. Earlier, Dr. Rizzo kindly said that he would stay late if there are a lot of questions at the end. So we thank him so much for his flexibility and for putting up with the sound issues that we just had. Um, just to help everyone know, and it seems like you know this already, there are two, two ways to talk. One is the chat on the right side of your screen, and that's really for the audience to talk to each other. And we have clinicians and experts in VR and XR in the, uh, in the chat to talk to you. If you have some specific question for Dr. Rizzo or myself, please put it in the Ask a Question tab at the bottom, and then I'll help uh, moderate going through those. Um, and without further ado, Dr. Rizzo, I am going to let go of the screen and put you up there. So let me put this down. <laughs> Oops, trying to put you up there. There you go. Okay, so I'm gonna begin to share my screen here. Let's hope everything works nicely. There you Please. go, and I'll, I'll put it up for you. All righty. Can you see and hear everything? Because I'm not hearing anything. I can see and hear everything. Okay. Well, here we go. Uh, let's get started. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm very sorry uh, for the delay, but we'll uh, we'll get rocking here. I may have to cut a bunch of slides out of my talk, um, but I'll try to talk fast or at least give a general overview, and then we can uh, get to the more important Q and A section. So. Let's talk about advances in clinical XR, stuff that's been going on for literally 25 years. Um, it's gotten really popular lately as the technology's finally caught up with the vision. And uh, what I'll do is uh, do a brief intro to VR, even though I'm sure most of you already know what it is that we're here for, um, and talk about three core applications in PTSD, ADHD, autism. I doubt we'll, we'll be able to dig into the virtual human work, um, and then we'll touch on some stuff at the end. But, you know, I'm not going to try to do death by PowerPoint today. I'll try to just plow through all this stuff. This is our, uh, our center at the University of Southern California, the Institute for Creative Technologies, where the MedVR lab resides, an interdisciplinary group. Over, you know, a couple decades, we've been doing work in psych, cognitive, motor, and virtual human work. I'll show a couple of video examples here. Hopefully you'll hear the sound. That is a PTSD exposure therapy app for uh, returning service members from Afghanistan and in Iraq. That's what it looked like 15 years ago. So you can see the difference in the graphic fidelity. In this case, we built tests of attention, memory, and executive function in the same simulation that we use for treating PTSD, reuse of content in this case. This is some of our early work from 1997. Um, 
using 3D projection for visual spatial skill testing and training. This happens to be a mental rotation assessment and training system, like one of our early projects. Um, one of our early head mount display projects, a virtual classroom for testing children with attention deficit disorder. This is what a child sees in the headset as they look around. They have to pay attention to what's going on on the blackboard or the green board. Meanwhile, systematic distractions are employed uh, so we can really begin to test children under realistic conditions. In physical and occupational therapy, using a precursor to connect, I think this is 2008 or nine, um, tracking users' movement and embedding it within a game like context to try to make, uh, at a low cost, the very boring, repetitive, and frustrating activities of physical rehab fun and engaging. Uh, we took the same technology and built an interface system for helping children with cerebral palsy be able to just to simply interact with video games, as you see here. <clears throat> the connect there. I'm going to stop that and just explain it really quick. Um, uh, we worked with the Cerebral Palsy Foundation, and the goal was make it so kids with severe motor impairments could play video games. Very simple ask. This little girl never played a video game before, didn't have the manual dexterity to operate a gamepad or a keyboard. So the one movement she had control over was lifting her arm up, like uh, as you saw in the bottom video. And so we tracked that movement, and that made the shark jump out of the water. We developed it and actually applied that strategy with a number of Xbox games and so forth. Finally, um, our work with virtual humans, which we won't be able to cover at the end, so I'll let these things play out a little bit. Um, the, the, what you'll see first is a virtual patient application. This is from, I think, 2012 at the USC School of Social Work. It'll become apparent as you see the dialogue. Good afternoon, Sergeant Castilla. What brings you in today? Well, my wife told me she thought I should talk to someone. She's been pretty concerned about me since a soldier suicide on base last week. Did you happen to know the soldier? Yes. He was a friend, but I met the Marine once or twice. He seemed normal at the time. I guess I'm afraid I might end up like him. Do you have any plans to hurt yourself? No. It certainly caught my mind, especially lately. I just need it all to stop. Sometimes I can't handle it. So in that case, that's a virtual patient for clinical training. The novice clinician gives novice clinicians a chance to screw up with a virtual patient before they get their hands on a live one. We now have a full authoring system to build out content, a little bit higher fidelity. Won't have time to show that. Uh, this guy here, Sim Coach, this was built in 2010. I like to set up with the history and then show where we're at now. But in this case, it was an online healthcare support agent that a lot of service members and veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan who didn't want to talk to a live provider to interact with this guy online, privately, anonymously, and find out about PTSD. Meanwhile, he could ask you questions, and if you reached a certain threshold on these screening questions, he might say, hey, it looks like you're having some trouble. Um, if you want, punch in your zip code down at the bottom, and I'll pop up a list of providers in your area. And I can also talk to you about what therapy involves. So let me let him introduce himself, and maybe I'll get invited back for another talk specifically on the virtual human work. Well, I'm not a real person, if that's what you're asking. But I'm based on the personality and experiences of real soldiers and Marines. I'm still just a piece of software, but I'm getting better all the time. So hopefully I can be a helpful piece of software to talk to. Okay, so with that, um, a lot of definitions for VR. Um, you know what, I think I'm going to skip over the definitions because I'm sure anybody on this talk um, is aware of what VR is. Um, but, you know, in mental health and rehabilitation, best metaphor is aviation simulation. So just as an aircraft simulator can test, train, treat, or, or can test and train piloting ability, we can test, train, teach, and treat psychological, cognitive, and motor functioning. In some sense, it's the ultimate Skinner box. Um, when we think about VR, think of the three eyes. This was a concept elucidated by Greg Berdea and another fellow back in the 90s. The three eyes, immersion, interactivity, and imagination. 
Um, when we talk about immersion, of course, we're talking about putting people in a head-mounted display, occluded from the outside world. Or in this case, with hand sensing. We can design a whole variety of upper extremity rehabilitation tasks, a topic I won't really touch on any further, but you can see the concept here using the what was formerly the leap motion sensor, now ultra haptics sensor, or ultra leap sensor, I believe they call it. Um, but you see the concept there. I'm assuming most people know what VR is all about. But I also believe VR can be done without a headset. It doesn't always have to have immersion. In this case, you can see the users in the lab and using a connect like 3D depth sensing camera. She's doing a balance training exercise. So imagine an elderly person with a safety harness Shifting her weight side to side, lean forward to speed up the penguin in this open source free game from 2002, Tux Racer, um, and basically give people a chance to practice skills that might lead to fall prevention, particularly in elderly populations. It doesn't always have to be on a big screen for it to be compelling or engaging the patients. You can do things on a laptop, um, you know, real bare bones uh, VR, but interactive. And also VR um, in terms of interactivity, um, I think virtual humans pre present a great case. So in this case, you'll see a job interview training system we developed for high functioning folks on the autism spectrum. So, you know, these are folks that are pretty talented, can do a job, but they have a hard time in the social context. So um, we built six different job interviewers, six different backdrops that represent different jobs. And each character can be set on three personality mode, soft touch, neutral, or son of a cranky interviewer. Um, so here's this character in soft touch mode. I'm glad you're here. In a minute, we'll get into some questions about the job. But before we do, why don't you just tell me about yourself? So you can carry on with that interview and practice a bunch, or you could pick another character, another backdrop, or make this character cranky, but let's pick another character, a different backdrop, and make her cranky. This is an entry-level position. I guarantee there will be things you won't like about this job. That said, what's the most important thing you think you're looking for in a job? So with that said, uh, I think Myron Kruger got it right back in the 90s, one of the early godfathers, VR and MR, mixed reality, whatever, whatever R you want to uh, attach. Um, you know, does more than just simply automate processes. It gives us an opportunity to leverage immersion and interactivity and imagination to create a new paradigm for the future. This is particularly relevant in healthcare. What we've seen from 1994, treating people for specific phobias, and now in the current time frame, uh, this is a short list of the clinical conditions where VR has been found to be useful for diagnostics or assessment or intervention treatment or for scientific research. So the field has come a long way. Back in 94, it was an aspirational vision. Technology then was not ready for prime time. It really sucked if you, if you were around back then. Um, but we always knew that the technology would catch up with the vision. And in the intervening years, a lot of people did research that has led to us having probably the largest uh, and most detailed scientific research literature of any VR use case in the areas of mental health and rehabilitation and general medicine, of course. Um, a lot of reasons why VR is so cool. I'm not gonna spend any time on this. Let's reduce it down if you're interested. That's a paper that goes into all those uh, reasons why VR is so relevant and cool. But let's reduce it down to five core elements, expose, distract, motivate, measure, and engage. And this pretty much covers some of the core elements that we can bring to the table in mental health and rehab. We'll talk briefly. I'm not sure how far I'm going to jump ahead here in a minute, but those are the areas we'll talk about. Uh, traumatic experiences, one area that really derives from exposure therapy, uh, a basic behavioral approach that uh, we know is scientifically based and evidence-based. 
uh, for helping people to confront their fears in a safe place and get over them with repeated exposure, thing we call extinction learning, but also there's cognitive elements that are relevant here. <clears throat> so in 97, uh, if you had claustrophobia, if you were being in enclosed spaces, you happen to be in Christine Batella's lab in Spain, uh, they put you in this room, close the door, and then gradually move the wall in on you. Um, you know, fear of heights was a big area where a lot of research was done in the mid to late 90s. And people said, hey, you know, this stuff is too cartoonish. It's never going to have a clinical effect. People aren't going to get engaged. Well, you know, first off, people with um, phobias are very cued to react to the, that kind of any kind of stimuli. And basically, this really underscored the idea that we can fool the brain with VR. That while your frontal lobes are telling you, yes, I'm in a simulation, nothing bad is going to happen to me, and hence the person is going to confront their fear, um, <clears throat> limbic system, the amygdala, reacts to the perceptual stimuli, the array of content, um, in a very primitive fashion. And you activate that fear structure and get people a little sweaty palms like and increased heart rate and all that. And that's where the magic happens. We can activate those emotions. We have an emotionally evocative technology, even if the person knows they're not in the real thing. And so, of course, you know, looking in the present or 2017, at least, uh, with a low cost headset, you can, we can build things that look a little bit more realistic. Um, and I particularly like um, this one where it pits your fear of heights against your love of kitty cats. So you got to walk out there and rescue the cat, uh, fear of uh, flying. Uh, very primitive graphics in 1997. Now you get stuff like this 20 years later that can be delivered on a standalone headset. This was deliverable on a, a Gear VR um, headset, Samsung Gear VR and Oculus Go. Uh, of course, you can do this in the Quest now, um, which is going to be the real workhorse, I believe, in the future of clinical VR. But it's a lot more credible, even if we know that the more primitive stuff actually still worked. And so people have used exposure therapy in a wide range of uh, clinical conditions like this. And the research collected over the years, this is from our lab and another lab in 2008, a meta-analysis documenting the clinical efficacy updated in 2015 uh, by uh, this uh, collection of European researchers documenting the value of VR in this area. Um, and more recently in the Journal of Anxiety Disorders from January 2019, full open access issue on VR applications showing a lot of positive data that continued this march towards scientific validation. Um, and some people have applied these applications for other species as well. I'm not going to spend any time on it. You get the point of this. I think this uh, Russian cow uh, piece might have been a real scam on the BBC, but not sure. But this one's for real. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this leads us to PTSD. Same principles apply here uh, that we can use this approach of exposure to help people confront and reprocess difficult emotional memories in a safe place. And there's cognitive elements. When you put people in VR, it's emotionally evocative. People talk about things they haven't talked about before. So. In the United States, uh, PTSD was a really big issue uh, from the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we got involved in uh, 2003 with the idea and developed the concept in 2004. Meanwhile, you know, uh, the problem hasn't gone away. Uh, we built a number of iterations that have been applied over the years. I'll just show um, a little bit of what that looks like coming up. But, you know, the rationale is to engage people in their trauma memory, but in a safe place. So these vets know they're in the clinical office. They're not in any threat, but they do react at a deep level <clears throat> to the threat. And by activating that repeatedly, but in a safe place, eventually that reaction dissipates. And there's also the element of cognitive behavioral therapy of discussing the issues with the patient. Um, this is not self-help. This is something that people um, have to have a well-trained clinician. I'm not going to let these videos run, but I just want to do a shout out to other groups that have done uh, VR PTSD in addition to us. Um, this is what it looked like. We stole a street from Full Spectrum Warrior, the game, without any funding and built out 
uh, this simulation in 2004. You could click a, a hit a, a key on your keyboard and make audio appear like crowd sounds. You could click another button and have gunfire um, appear. You could click another button and have a helicopter land. That was then, this is now. By going through it there, it's not going through my head at night when I'm trying to sleep or when I'm with my wife, when times when I don't want it to, to come up and me start thinking about it. Traumatic things are not normal. You cannot handle the, the things that you've seen and done. And this is a tool that has helped me out tremendously. Reliving the worst moments of his life has helped him to move on with his life. I'm probably about 80% of who I was before I left. But I think that's pretty good after seeing and doing the things that you've done. For Nightline. Okay. So as I said, this is not self-help. This is a tool to extend the skills of a well-trained clinician that's well-versed in this type of trauma-focused therapy. Technology doesn't fix anybody. It's a tool to extend the skills of the clinician. In some cases, under clinical supervision to support um, at-home self-help. But I still think we have to keep a focus on delivering clinical care in an ethical and professionally sound fashion with the clinician. Now, in the PTSD app, this is from the original version. We could put people in different locations in that simulation. We could make things happen in the simulation. We could monitor the physiology. We could see what they see. That's from the, the first clinical version. That's what the interface looks like now, Wizard of Oz interface that the clinician operates from. As you can see in this image here, there's your clinician, there's your user, last version using old school technology. Uh, we now use current uh, modern head mounted displays, uh, as you'll see later. Um, and so clinical research, again, another old school headset. I think that image is from 2006 with an Imagine headset, former workhorse in this area. Very limited though. Um, anyway, data, I'm not gonna uh, beat you up with too much data, but here is uh, pre, post, and three month follow-up PTSD symptom ratings in the first clinical trial, which was an open clinical trial. 16 no longer met PTSD criteria to end a treatment, four did not benefit. Later on, other researchers that we collaborated with have documented with the later versions of the clinical system um, significant benefits is in an intensive three-week treatment. That's why you get such a large effect size, uh, Deborah Bidel's work. Um, re more recently, we've done modifications to create a military sexual trauma PTSD app. We thought we'd have an easy go of it modifying our combat-related content. But it turned out many people that um, have had sexual assaults in the military have happened in civilian environments around military bases in the United States. So we had to build out some civilian content. Um, we had to build out a perpetrator that would turn up or follow you around that was adjustable, controllable. Keep in mind, we're not reproducing sexual assaults. We're creating a context in which these events happen to help the patient to confront and reprocess difficult emotional memories in a safe place. I would underscore that. And sometimes people get creeped out by this. And when we got funded to do this, we were limited to the number of people that we could run in this to make sure it was more of a safety and feasibility trial. We'd make sure we weren't messing with people um, and creating more problems than we were solving. And it turned out we had no critical incidents. And along the way, with a small sample, uh, we saw clinically meaningful and statistically significant reductions in PTS with this group and pretty strong effect sizes for considering the um, the size of the sample there. So encouraging work, still a lot more to go, and now translating this to civilian sexual trauma is a big mission. One of the things to keep in mind with VR, we're not just, um, uh, you know, developing something that might improve efficacy, but it might appeal to service members and break down barriers to care for in a digital generation of service members. And we actually found this when 
We ran a recent randomized controlled trial comparing the traditional imagination only method of exposure with VR at informed consent when we told people about each of the treatments, but that they would be randomly assigned for the research to one of those treatments. We asked them at that moment, if you had your choice of knowing what you know now, what would you pick? And the good news for VR was that almost 77% of people said they would have picked VR had they had a choice. So breaking down barriers to care with an engaging format for treatment may be just as important as the efficacy. Um, now, we're really focused on civilian translation. Uh, there's plenty of trauma in the world. Um, first responders, you know, no different than service members, except they do it for 20 years at a time every day. Um, and so we've been working with a couple of groups on de-escalation uh, simulations and training um, that may lead to PTSD-like training or treatment um, with police uh, forces to try to reduce some of the problems we've seen as of late. But um, other people in the front lines, look at from 2014, the nurse suicide rate um, significantly higher uh, than the general population and higher for females, high stress occupations that need attention. And uh, same thing with physicians, uh, higher suicide rate in physicians, again, with females uh, uh, having a higher rate than males in this situation. That's from 2019, pre-COVID. Now we start looking at COVID and we start seeing from studies done in China, significant mental health distress in healthcare providers working with COVID patients, rightfully so, what a hellish uh, situation. And in this study, with 714 COVID survivors, right before they were released, they survived, they filled out the PTSD checklist. 96% met PTSD criteria. Now, it doesn't mean they have PTSD because these screening measures measure what would be a normal response to highly stressful events. PTSD is diagnosed when those symptoms endure over time and don't go away, you don't readjust. Um, but this is alarming and this is leading, uh, you know, uh, a movement towards recognizing we've got to start addressing trauma across a wide range of areas. We currently have an online survey to document uh, mental health problems, uh, healthcare providers, service members, and the general population. Uh, you can send me an email if you want this link and participate. Uh, we also have uh, a couple of proposals out for cross-platform approach using web-based mobile and VR headset solutions, uh, taking everything we learned from the military and translating it to civilian needs in this area. Um, you know, testing and training and cognitive function. Uh, I'm gonna go for about five more minutes. Let me show this application and the autism stuff and then I'll stop there. Um, but basically in cognitive function, this is from, uh, actually this is from 1994, but this is generally a collection of worlds for helping people with cognitive disabilities learn everyday functional skills. Graphics again are pretty impoverished. But they worked, and in this case here from 1994, David Brown and his group uh, showed that uh, in the very first case of transfer of training from a VR training uh, scenario, very primitive, mind you, to the real world. And this is with people with serious intellectual disabilities, um, you know, perhaps a, a benchmark IQs between 60 and 80, um, and they trained in this environment and then went to the real place. They had a control group as well. And they found that this uh, object finding task had transferred to the real world. First case of a clinical population uh, really shown the benefits of training in VR. Of course, things have gotten better. My friend and colleague in Australia, Sebastian Conid, building out on unreal you know, home environments for training people after a stroke or a traumatic brain injury, safety and in operating in a kitchen and so on, uh, testing executive function skills. You know, these are all areas that I think VR is, this is what got me into VR in the first place in the early 90s. I, I worked clinically in brain injury rehab and was disgusted with the crap we had for uh, training tools, paper and pencil stuff. We needed to build simulations and that's what we're seeing here. So. One of our early projects, as you saw before, I'm going to stop this. Um, as you saw before, virtual classroom for testing kids with ADHD. This is the version from 2003. Um, 
testing kids in this environment on core metrics of missed targets. They have to pay attention to stimuli on the blackboard, hit when they see an A followed by an X. Missed targets, ADHD kids, healthy controls, hitting when there was no target, significant difference. Reaction time, slower. Reaction time variability, more variable across the 10 minute trial. Also in VR, the head tracking allows us to track motor movement, the hyperactivity component. So we see again, um, with without distraction, we see ADHD kids fidgeting more and with distraction that goes up. Meanwhile, no significant change with your healthy control population. So one cool thing about VR is that we can represent data in ways that are intuitively graspable. So what you see here is a randomly selected ADHD child, this red line, this is their head movement over a 10 minute trial. Um, if you look closely, you'll see a green line of a neurotypical healthy control, and you see very little head movement over time. Uh, that's a good way to visualize how head movement may contribute to uh, problems with maintaining attention in a classroom under controllable conditions. But with VR, we can do something even more cool. We can actually take that same exact data and plant it onto these little avatar heads here. And so we're 22 seconds, 23 seconds into a 10 minute trial, 53 seconds. And they're looking at the blackboard now forward. And you see the ADHD kids doing pretty well. It's still early on in the test and the neurotypical may look away. Now we're at five minutes. Neurotypical looks away, but they get back on task right away. Now we're starting to see the ADHD child, you know, get distracted and look away. Um, even though they've seen these distractions a number of times already. And you see over time, it gets worse. Now you're gonna see in seven minutes what we call the exorcist clip. This is actual head tracking data. And uh, that's real data. And now he's gonna see the paper airplane flying around the room. He's gonna follow it as it goes by. And now he's gonna look up at the ceiling and you get the impact of distraction on these kids' performance. Um, also, in addition to the intuitive visualization, you get actual data. So you can tell how many times the kid's looking out the window and missing a target in front of them versus how many times they're looking straight forward and missing that target. So that's a big diagnostic question to inform a treatment plan. A um, bunch of research has been done with that version. The good news is we now have a new version. This is a version that was tested in Taiwan. We have an American version, and we now have the capability of allowing researchers to integrate their own tasks from a software program put up by Psychology Software Tools called E-Prime, so that any researcher can build a test and pop it into the virtual environment and do all the things we do with our traditional attention tasks. So now it becomes a platform for doing research in that ultimate Skinner box controlled stimulus environment. Um, this is collaboration I have with a company called Cognitive Leap. Uh, we have a standardization sample of 700 healthy control kids now in the United States. Uh, you'll hear more about this in the future. Um, autism, let me just touch on this and then we'll jump right to the end. Uh, again, these are folks oftentimes that have, uh, you know, strong intellectual capabilities, creative abilities, but, uh, you know, a lot of times they have difficulty in social situations. Dorothy Strickland did early work in the 90s with these kids, teaching them street safety and escape from a burning house. I had a video I'm not going to show here, um, but other groups have done social skill training. Uh, from 2002, different contexts where you could help somebody learn how to be more socially appropriate. More recently, this group out of the University of Texas in Dallas, Center for Brain Health, uh, did really remarkable work, but using Second Life, where it was labor intensive, you have to have researchers or clinicians play the role of the person. But regardless of the labor intensive element of it, and this stuff can be automated with autonomous agents, something I would have talked about later. Um, what they did show is changes in after training and brain activation in areas that, of the brain that underlie social understanding. 
Um, that work has been expanded into a larger study and positive findings continued. Um, I want to finish this section with just a little mention of our work again with job interview training, the different characters we use, the different backdrops, and let one of the users um, talk about their experience here. It's a good program and it teaches you how to do an interview and it teaches you how to be in an interview situation with another, with another person. And did you see your performance improve? Did it, you get better? I get, I, get, I get better every single time I do it, I get better. This is a, recent, this is a study from 2017 showing changes in face-to-face -face interview in red, pre and post and the progression over time. Sample of 64, uh, just a couple of days ago, um, another study with this application with 180 kids, I believe, or teenagers, um, showing uh, even more potent impact on transfer training to the face-to-face -face live Hey, interview. thanks for coming in. How's it going? We've Hi. done this in uh, augmented reality. Okay. And I'm not gonna let that video play in the interest of time, but I wanna play this one. So that you can see this is a partnership we had last couple years. Instead of using a TV screen to deliver a job interview character, with the Magic Leap system, we can actually have a person sit in a real room in a real job interviewing context. A lot of us, we were isolated, um, or at least we didn't have many friends. At least I didn't have any friends. So we're always around the technology. That's how we connect with people. Definitely think with a DMF with Magic Leap will add a lot. It's really going to help us expand our, our reach. All right, with that, I'm going to jump to one closing slide here and then go to one more after this. You know, I talk about um, VR is ready for prime time in the clinical space. Well, I think if we saw the whole talk, you would see that across wide range of areas with the exposed, distract, motivate, measure, and engage. It's theoretically informed. We're doing things that have a theoretical basis. We've got scientific support growing all the time. Much more to do, certainly, particularly with dismantling studies and studies that pick out individuals in advance that might benefit from this over traditional methods. Um, we've got low-cost, high-fidelity technology now. That's a big game changer and a passionate development community. People are pumped about this stuff. And that's 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 something that warms an old man's heart here. <laughs> so I'm very happy for all the youngins that are, uh, that are diving into this. Um, but one thing I mentioned before, keep in mind, we can break down barriers to care. If we can draw more people into getting the treatment that they can benefit from, uh, then we might be able to really do something. I think mixed reality and uh, all the reality apps that we can talk about may have a strong impact. With that said, let me just finish up. You know, of course, the market reports, there's oftentimes overhyped, but the good news in this market report was, well, video games and entertainment had the lion's share, healthcare came in second, and that has been updated more recently, showing a very bright future in healthcare. Uh, companies have been sprouting up left and right. This is a company from the 90s. It was about the only one for a while, but in the last few years, more new commercial enterprises in this area than in the previous 20 years. Um, we have scientific events that are going on all over the world that create a community to help us share our results and grow creative ideas to expand this. So even though we have to do it online but for now, um, you know, we're still all together like this event today. Um, you know, we know for the young at heart, it's great. My first, wow. this was my first Samsung Gear VR Christmas 2015, I believe, yeah. my niece and nephew. Well, the night before um, I flew back to Connecticut, I got in at three in the morning. My flight was delayed. My mom was waiting up for me though. and. I got in the door with my suitcase and first thing I did was crack a beer and I said, mom, you're going to try this new VR headset. So this is my, at the time, 83 year old mom having a VR experience in a Samsung Gear VR headset. <laughs> My God, it looks like my backyard, my yard with the snow. Oh, Lord in heaven. 
how they ever can create this. You know what? I'm hanging on to the sink because I'm afraid I'm going to fall down down the cliff. <laughs> yeah, honest to God. You feel like, oh, you, you, if you step off, you're going to fall right in there. Holy mackerel. And one last pitch for my mom. If you're watching this, please fund my son's research so that he can take care of me in my old age. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you. I'm sorry I had to cut the talk short, but I put in some jump points so that that would be possible. Next time, okay. a little more time. That's wonderful. And we I, just wonderful, insightful, all kinds of information. And, um, and you did a great job cutting it short. Sorry about the audio. Um, so I'm going to jump right into questions because um, Dr. Rizzo has been so kind as to stay after the hour. Um, so I have a couple first, um, and I, I, I'd like to start and ask, because a lot of the audience may be in research, um, if you want to make any comments about what it really means to submit yourself to scientific rigor and how, I think you used a phrase with me one time, which I thought was so funny, was, uh, how did you get those things that escaped from your lab? How did this happen? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's, uh, you know, that's the double duty here. Um, you know, you can do great science um, in the lab and build things that work in the lab and you demo for visitors and under, you know, with a whole team of folks, you can run the, run the research and so on. Uh, but building products is a whole nother animal and a whole different set of, of skills. And a lot of times uh, university professors or academics or scientists don't necessarily have those skills. So it necessarily, uh, requires a partnership. I don't think you can build successful commercial products and help this stuff escape the lab without that interdisciplinary collaboration. I used to say the interdisciplinary collaboration was, you know, psychologists, social workers, whatever on the clinical side with programmers, artists, game designers, and so on. But now it's business people. Uh, you know, that has to be brought into the mix. You know, you can have, I've seen so many cool ideas and well executed great things that could make a difference but no thought as to who's going to pay for it or how you're going to disseminate it or make it available it's a little bit easier now that you've got standalone headsets you know yeah um, yeah you know i've got a few of them here and by the way um i want to show one that is a historical piece this this is a pre-Oculus headset that was built in our lab with Mark Bolas and Palmer Lucky before he started Oculus uh, in our lab. And uh, this was designed to work with, um, uh, for our PTSD work, but it was a little bit early. Uh, That's really uh, cool. But it, but it illustrates, you know, we, we did prototypes in the lab, mm -hmm. but certainly didn't have the funding that ended up being required to evolve Oculus. Right. And so I hate to say it, but money is a, a big driver. You've got to have investment. Um, some people do it very well on a small budget, but getting it out into the marketplace, making it available, these are big challenges. Challenges I'm still daunted by, even though I have a toe in the water now with pretty much half my time being spent outside of the academic world with that mission Let's get shit out the door. Yeah, and I give it up to, uh, as a serial entrepreneur who's in, going into research, right? I'm almost finished becoming a PhD. It, it's been a crazy thing to learn the other side, the proof, 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 right? Like, so, so wow. Yeah. So like both directions, and that's one of the things we're trying to do really, really well here is try to bring those directions together um, for medicine and VR. Um, so I have a couple other questions, but like mostly I wanted you to have a moment to say, this, over the last three to five years, this is the thing I'm the most excited about, or the couple things. Like, do you have a, like, you just like, I mean, obviously you're so passionate about the work that you're doing. So I don't mean to say, hey, repeat your talk, but is there something that you're just like, man, this is the best. I can't, can't get over this. Do you have something like that to share? Uh, well, there's, there's so many good things happening now. Um, you know, for a couple of years, and I had a slide on this, uh, is VR dead? 
because it was, you know, I went through this back in, uh, two, in 95, you know, right when I first started the lab, it was like when the bottom fell out of VR after the first hype cycle and VR was a joke, you know, it was a failed technology. And, you know, the, tech, the enabling technologies weren't there, you know, so, but the vision was sound. Um, now we have that technology to be able to deliver this at a low cost. So I'm excited about standalone headsets about you know like the quest or the pico and all the other ones that are going to come online and if we can get the graphic horsepower up um in the next generation or maybe you have a little wire that goes into your mobile phone your mobile phone is processor and you got the 5g connection and cloud-based stuff i mean there, I'm, I'm totally excited about that from a technical perspective the other area i'm really excited about is of course the area i didn't get a chance to really go into any detail today is the uh, virtual human ai component uh we're get we're you know we're pretty much you know hitting a ceiling on graphic fidelity well i shouldn't say that but graphic fidelity for creating places to put people in but now populating those places with characters that serve some useful function foster a credible interaction, whether it's training clinicians, whether it's delivering healthcare uh, information in a private anonymous way that helps somebody to engage in their healthcare a little more. Mobile apps yeah. where you develop, a, uh, I mean, so many great mobile apps are out there in, in healthcare that people use for a day or two and then they they stop using it. Maybe you put in a virtual human in a mix where you start to feel yep. it. I gotta tell you like human, the whole human back in the human interface is the deal, right? Like, so, and uh, with uh, immediate facial mocap, so um, animation captures. So I have a little headset and I will put it right into Unreal, you know, like live, just like that, run my characters, right? So, and then the, the finesse of being able to do little facial movements and everything. But um, there was one question in the queue about that. So I'll bring it up now. Um, do you think that the fidelity, has there been any sort of proof around the improved fidelity making a difference because our brain can do wonderful things if it's just marginal, right? So have you seen any kind of research that's proving that the, the higher fidelity is really making a difference in your research? I, it really depends on what your goal is. Um, you know, uh, in different conditions, I think higher fidelity is essential. My colleague, Jessica Brillhart, who's now at USC, um, she's really on the march that we need to not spend as much resources on high level graphics and focus more on the interaction that goes on in the, in the simulation. That's a really good point. However, <laughs> I'm like, where's the research on that though? Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> there, there, you know, there's bits and scraps here, but it, you know, it's in a constrained area of procedural interaction with objects. Do they have to look real or whatever? But there's this funny little thing called face validity, and it also has to go on with um, with a product. Uh, you know, if I'm going to have a product that has 1994 graphics for fear of heights, and a person that's considering uh, doing that treatment looks at that versus something that's nice, shiny, spanky, new, flashy. Right. That person may go with that therapist that's using the newer version, not because that newer version is going to have a greater clinical impact, but because there's that placebo effect yeah, or that yeah, yeah. even the modernness of it. So, you know, in healthcare, I think this is a good scientific um, question that needs more research, but it's always going to be constrained to the topic area that you're doing that research in, whether it's healthcare, whether it's factory equipment training, or whether it's communication skills. Um, can I practice with a South Park character and get better at job interviewing or social skill training? You know, particularly the Canadian South Park character. Um, I mean, if you want to go to the, the low rung, well, maybe. Yeah. But I uh, see that research. And as long as I can start to make things look a little bit more real, uncanny valley aside, which I have some real concerns that while that's a big issue in robotics, it's a little bit less with 3D computer graphics, by the way. Sure. Well, that's another talk. Um, but, um, you know, uh, we can do it. I guess the key question is, how do you spend your resources? Right. You know, it's like, What's you know, you, you, do you date a person that's really super attractive that has no personality or do you find a mix? And maybe that's the mix we have to find here, the cosmetic people. <laughs> Uh, with 
you know, it's something that has a little go under the hood. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, and we've got 18 qu questions in the queue and I just want to tell people, I'm just going to shout out the next talk. Five minutes. Yep. The next talk is July 29th. Uh, we have a really good talk on a prototype in a, a clinical study. And we've got Kate Donovan and uh, Brandon Brickhead um, doing a really wonderful talk on the 29th at 12, which is a uh, two weeks from today on Wednesday. So I just, you'll see that up on the website. I just want to shout that out so people know if they have to leave. But let me get into the other questions, if that's okay with you, Skip. Does that sound all right? Okay, great. And um, I just, I don't, if anyone in the audience wants to, wants to look at really cool games with avatars, like Detroit being human is like amazing, right? I don't know if you've played that, Skip, but you know, I work in avatars like all the time, right? So it's like that game, you take a look at that game and you're getting so close to real and you can do that now even on your samsung gear vr so i love that you brought that up the samsung gear vr um people will poo poo the things you can do just on little standalones with your phone in vr and honestly for three years i've been doing stuff on a phone in vr that's amazing for medicine right so so i i think um i'm with you on the tethered stuff the heart the workhorse but um you can do so much so it's amazing that you brought that up and um all right, let me get to some of the other questions too. So I'm gonna go through them in order. So when VR um, is used for a length of time for healing PTSD trauma over time, uh, can the patient or the practitioner see part of the brain traumatized healing? So they're saying like, they're tying it to, one of the audience members has responded to a little bit. Are you actually seeing healing in the brain? Do you know about that area? We have one study uh, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Mike Roy at Walter Reed um, who looked at pre-post treatment um, with people in an fMRI being exposed to standardized combat st stimuli from the Brave Mind app and saw changes in brain activation in the direction that you would theoretically expect. So you saw less activation of the amygdala when confronted with the stimuli in the magnet. Uh, more activation in some of the frontal areas of the brain that are implicated in modulating um, emotion. Um, and we still have a, a ton of work. Um, we're, we're actually, have a, we have an NIH project on a review with, we call Brief Exposure, where you present the cues of the, of the traumatic event for five milliseconds and then follow it by uh, something else. And what the person reports is seeing the something else that follows. It's called backward masking. Yep. Um, but when you look at what's going on in the brain during that five milliseconds, you see an act, a little spike in the amygdala activation. So the brain is, re is receiving that signal, even though it doesn't fall in conscious awareness. So there's opportunities like that. I mean, there's so many opportunities some of it, I'm not sure if it's snake oil or what, like for example, the uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Some people swear by that stuff. People are trying to integrate it with VR. I think we need to see more research. Binaural beats in terms of audio stimulation uh, integrated with, there's a couple of companies that are putting out meditation and relaxation scenarios, Magic Horizons, Meta Medical, number of groups using this kind of audio stimulation, but it's all with this idea that there's some process in the brain that we can combine with building an immersive or whatever experience yeah. that we can bring those things together and have change in the brain. But there certainly isn't enough research with- Yeah, with definitely not. I mean, like we are at UMass Medical with the Shriver Center, which is a center for autism and other um, intellectual disability disorders and challenges. And we are starting, just starting the conversations around doing more with the brain tracking and tying it into VR and AR and other things like that. So so we're putting in to do work in that area. So we should stay in touch on that too. The yeah, um, So several people are asking about what you're doing next. Uh, what's your next area? And I'm going to and you know, there's there's people saying, "Hey, can are you hiring and things like that?" I'll leave that for outside the conversation. But the um, do you have a, a next thing that you're working on, or do you want to talk about that a little bit? Or yes, um, the areas we're working on now really, uh, you know, we've done a lot of work across the core areas in the basic science area, but now the mission is getting things out the door. So for the PTSD work, for example, let's take one instance because there's like five of these, you know different vectors, but for the PTSD work, we have a, a foundation 
that now is providing free equipment to any VA that will use the BraveMind application. Uh, the, the previous versions have gone to about 100 clinical sites, but now as of November, we have a brand new version that really is pretty tricked out. So this foundation called Soldier Strong will pay for all the equipment we give and we're trying to push it out the door and evolve the research because we have data that shows people that are depressed and have PTSD do much better in VR than the traditional method. Um, everybody else, you know, textbook PTS, it's, it's pretty much the same, but people like the VR more. Okay, so translating that work, that's very, you know, stepwise, but now translating to the civilian population and first responders, healthcare providers, post-COVID world, escape room type training for children to learn how to avoid getting in, uh, exposed to COVID or transmitting it where, you know, you, you touch something in a grocery store and you're not careful, your hand turns green and starts glowing. You go home and hug your grandmother. She wilts right. like a witch of the West, you know, that kind of, kind of thing to try to, you know, anyway. So there's that, there's also resilience training. I wanna get police officers before they get on the beat doing VR story-based simulations to learn how to diffuse situations and how to manage their own emotions while they're doing it. You don't wanna wait till they're 20 years on the beat and they're emotionally numb and they're hypervigilant, which are two symptoms of PTSD, not enough to be diagnosed, but enough to have a hair trigger or to do something provocative. I wanna dig into that. Uh, all the virtual human stuff is fair game, working with a number of companies to expand all that work. So I don't know if I have any new ideas anymore, just trying to take the stuff we know works and get it out. That's how I want to spend the rest of my career. I want, I yeah, want to get yeah. things, escape the lab. Yeah, that's the, um, you know, like when you were talking about the, the first decades, you know, the 2000s, even the 1990s, the 2000s, and even the 10s, um, we're sort of that promise and now it's like the deliver, you know, it's like, that's the, it's time that we've finally gotten that intersection of all of those things. Um, right related to that topic you were just talking about, some, someone was asking about the sort of uh, devil's advocate of is um, if you put them in VR, are they more isolated when they come out when you're trying to treat PTSD? You know, is there, is there like a downside to doing this training in VR? I think they were, you know, asking that question. That was an interesting little question too. So, yeah. yeah. Well, well, certainly, um, you know, we're very fond of saying we have this emotionally evocative technology. We can activate emotions in a positive way and, and help people to overcome uh, their challenges. And but then they're gonna, alone, right? Yeah. Yeah, if you're, if you're going to buy into this emotionally evocative power that VR has, you've got to accept that if not used properly, it could go the other way. So, for example, with the PTS stuff, you know, we have, in order to be able to get access to the software, you have to document that you have certification in delivering traditional exposure therapy and that you have, a, a, you know, you have supervised experience in doing this kind of treatment. It could go south, it hasn't. People originally said, oh, you're gonna re-traumatize people. You're gonna make it worse for them. Uh, show me the data where that's happened. I mean, maybe that has happened and it's never been reported. You've gotta keep that in mind. But for the most part, um, you know, we find that we're not having that effect. Again, it's being used by people that are well trained. Right. So, and they've been using that type of therapy for, for VR kind of thing like that. Yeah. So somebody asked a question about the foundation. Uh, I just want to do a shout out. It's called Soldier Strong. If you punch that in on Google, it'll pop right up. You'll see, if you look around, you'll see a PTSD uh, section on our website. All right. So we have the next question, I'm not sure I'm reading this right, but it's, um, any thoughts on how PTSD work, particular on the PTSD work, particularly for prevention and de-escalation, and how it might translate to stress uh, resilience for training for youth? Right. So, so I'm not 100% sure I get the the meaning behind that, but I see the question. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, you know, we're, we're looking at a, a project that could get funded through Health and Human Services that look at disadvantaged youth uh, that have had what they call adverse childhood experiences, the acronym ACE. And, and 
you know, you once once you've had those bad experiences, you know, your parental abuse or loss of a parent or, you know, a motor vehicle accident as a kid, but whatever. Um, now you've got to look at a forming human and is their life going to be guided by that particular trauma or are you going to be able to intervene in some form or fashion? And oftentimes intervention is hard medicine for a hard problem. Getting people to talk about it, to attack uh, faulty reasoning, cognitive distortions, teaching them ways to manage stress. So I think this is an, a way important area and helping people in simulations, you know, even youth as they're coming up, I think is an important area. I mean, when people are skeptical about this stuff, I often, uh, you know, back, I don't have to do it as much anymore, but I would say when you're flying, like at a conference, a psychology conference, and I had skeptics, I'd say, look, when you're flying home from this conference, would you rather your pilot trained in a, and was certified in a simulator for how to deal with wind shear and all the emotional and procedural skills involved in that? Um, or uh, would you rather he learned it from a book or she learned it from a death by power? lecture or on the job training right. and that is at its core the element if you're talking about somebody having difficult emotional interaction with the world maybe we can do that in vr even at a young age that builds resilience puts people in context where they can learn coping skills that they wouldn't learn from a book or from yeah. somebody lecturing them yeah, and, and um, my, my research is in the area of digital coaches, so I work more in AR, but that notion that I'm working with uh, autistic teens and young adults that, that need an additional bolstering in real life, you know, so mine will go out in the field with them, but but that's just so, uh, thanks. I wasn't understanding that question exactly, I don't think, so I've got it now. But um, so so then I have some other questions here. Um, one of them is talking about, um, uh, I, I think we answered the cognitive theory one, but um, how are you feeling about the use of machine learning in combination? And and I know you've worked in machine learning with some of your work, so that's a good one for you too. Well, certainly this is a, um, a significant power that uh, we have this capability. I mean, uh, you know, insurance companies have been using actuarial data to decide, you know, if you're, you're the cost of insurance, uh, depending on pre-existing conditions, is sort of a negative use of, um, of uh, you know, big data in a primitive form. But now, when we can quantify what people do in precise stimulus conditions in a VR environment, and we can collect large amounts of data, that is a tool for evolving the approach that we take. Uh, whether it's tracking facial expressions, looking at acoustic properties of speech during an interaction, how much somebody navigates, what their mobile phone tells us about their everyday life, all privacy issues aside. Uh, you know, th there's, uh, it's beyond a human brain to be able to analyze all that data by experience and see unique patterns that vary according to the person's personality or their past history or their current uh, emotional status and so on. So uh, there's no doubt that, you know, it's a double-edged sword. We have to be very careful about this, but machine learning is, is here to stay. And now we've got to get behind it in a way to harness it for a good purpose, not just to sell you shit on the internet, but to, um, you know, benefit healthcare and understand all these things that go beyond any one individual's capacity uh, yeah. to and and tie, it, tie it back to your earlier comment about the true multidisciplinary notion of getting something out of your lab. And like all of these, you know, efforts when you do the deeper research tend to be on prototypes or stubbed out components. And so when you take some of these solutions to the street, chances are you're bringing in machine learning and other things and you have to have an architecture that deploys, right? Like, so, so that I think tie it right into that topic of, yeah, yeah you got to get the, the business and the engineers like bringing in the full architecture. Yeah. Um, so we got a really interesting one. It was sort of the elephant in the room about COVID-19, right? So of course we have to talk about that. Um, they're saying I'm not writing research, but I'm writing a paper about it. Um, so 
I think they're saying like, who gets the ventilator and who doesn't? And how can you be with your loved ones when they're sick and dying? And, you know, what, you know, are there any ideas around the use of VR that you would like to bring forward based on your PTSD work and or any of your work? And so someone responded a little bit to that one, but I wanted to give it to you too. Yeah, well, you know, look at COVID is an accelerator for um, the challenges it presents are going to accelerate the use of technology in healthcare dramatically. Um, you see this in the telehealth area. Things that wouldn't have happened for two or three years from now are going to happen this year or next year um, because now we, we're confronted. The urgency of the problem um, is driving innovation. And so what you just said, well, how, you know, uh, somebody dying without their loved ones being able to be in the same room with them. Is there a telepresence approach uh, that might be helpful? Or is there a way to help deal with the psychological repercussions of a doctor or a nurse having to see that time and time again? We're going to see, we're going to see a, a just like, you know, I, I've been telling some of my colleagues, this is like 2004 all over again, except instead of it being veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, it's going to be healthcare providers that went through the COVID meat grinder. And we've got to be prepared to be able to help them to maintain that workforce um, if there's a third or fourth or eighth wave or the next one right. or whatever. We've got to be prepared for that. We've got to be able to help people that survive it. We've got to be able to help the folks that, that also lose people along the way, various grieving approaches that may be uh, done in VR. There's a whole VR and death movement, a positive movement, but uh, that's going on. Um, a colleague on Facebook has set up a group on this thing. How do you teach doctors to give bad news to people? Big topic in medicine. Um, you know, are you going to be a, a cold Spock like robot? Uh, or do you have empathy? But how, you know, how do you keep your soul at the same time? You're being presented with things that have never happened before in your lifetime. Um, By the way, a comment on that one, just um, because I work so much in multiplayer. Um, so I know we're talking about, you know, sort of singular headsets, but I work in multiplayer VR a lot. And some of that sort of uh, triage training when you're giving bad news or you're or just working with other professionals is really getting interesting too, right? So the fact that you can have three or four people in a space going through a simulation together is where I've been doing a bunch of work. And um, that is coming up right here it comes like i think that's one of those biggies that I, I one of these days i'll take the hot seat and be the speaker and i'll i'll talk about some of that stuff too so um okay so so someone's asking about robotics and vr for medicine and if you have been doing any work in that area or want to make any comments about that um the the direct use of uh, robotic devices um there, there's a, a number of companies that are producing socially assistive robots uh, for social training and for kids interaction and so on. Certainly robots, uh, robotic devices have been used in physical rehab mixed with VR, mixed reality environments in order to provide force feedback and control of movement with, you know, expensive robotic devices like the Haptic Master uh, and some of the old Immersion Corp stuff. I mean, bunches of, but they're very expensive and they're complicated. Um, and it's not something you're going to have in someone's home. Um, so, you know, it, again, it's like, where do you deploy these things and how do you use them? In a way to maximize so them? there's another thing that came up in the last talk with Walter, too, that, um, that we were talking about haptics for a minute and how haptics has been the not a laggard because it's so complicated, but it's sort of behind, you know, what, you know, we're all moving so fast now. And uh, Walter, of course, Walter Greenleaf, who's so brilliant, um, his comment was, remember, because we were talking sort of about medical use for training at that point, you know, so the robotics for training and repeating surgeries and things like that, is he said, you know, Julie, the, um, the use of AI is going to come right in there. If you think you, if you think the future isn't full of us not doing the surgery, you're forgetting the other parts of technology, right? Almost that will that will that's me paraphrasing it, but I I think um, the robotics tying to what we're seeing in VR in, in the future of practicing surgery and other things like that might be very interesting. 
Um, but not, I'm not commenting on the cognitive side in this one, but that came no. up last one. It's interesting, you know? Well, well, I mean, if you, if you look at the Da Vinci robot, um, you know, the, the interface is, you know, something that is very easily attachable to a VR simulation. So that before you ever operate on a patient, you're using the same interface you're going to use on a patient, but interacting with VR uh, content so that you can see the curve balls once you open someone up or, uh, you know, once you're in there and, and, and be well trained. Um, you know, that's good because the, there's a one-to-one -one mapping of the interface from the VR simulation to the person. So that's a good example of robotic surgery being trained with a simulation. I mean, it's not even, the docs don't even think about it as VR. They just think about, okay, this is my training thing to learn how to use this robot. And, uh, you know, it's just accepted as just a normal thing. Yeah, and it, and it does, and in the last, we were talking about the reduction of need for cadavers and things like that, a little out of the wheelhouse here. But um, so the next question is about vision and somebody's asking about, are you seeing any problems with uh, vision after using the VR for, uh, you know, are, are they having issues with nearsightedness, farsightedness, things like that? Well, that, that's certainly a, a, a consideration that we have to look into, particularly with young children. Um, you know, the good or bad news is that simply, you know, people don't spend hours and hours and hours in a VR headset. It's very rare. Um, so that near uh, screen delivery, you know, at least in the clinical domain, you know, maybe somebody's in it for a half hour uh, once a week or twice a week or whatever the time frame is. And I'm not sure if there's been any real research showing that that, those smaller dosages uh, really lead to any problems. Certainly the technology is getting better, but we can't rule out that if somebody was to be using a VR headset as part of their job for six hours a day, um, you know, would there be some visual impact? I mean, look at the visual impact that we have for just from 1990 to the current day from looking at screens 10, 12 hours a day. Um, so these are good issues to pay attention to. Um, the whole thing about head-mounted displays, you know, the, the cyber sickness element, um, you know, these are things we have to pay attention to. And the other thing we have to pay attention to in a post-COVID world, we've kind of had it easy uh, up to now. You know, you, when people are sharing a headset, you give it a quick wipe, you know, and pass it on. Well, I don't think that's going to fly anymore. So, you know, you see companies like Cleanbox, you know, building devices and other companies using ultraviolet C-band um, stuff. In one minute you put the headset in and 99.9 .9 allegedly percent of bacteria or pathogens are, are gone. We have to, we're going to have to start really paying attention uh, to that. So there are these pragmatic functional things. Does it produce eye strain? Is there long-term impact? Um, we just don't have enough of the data to say that, but also, people don't use headsets for so long that that may be a likely occurrence. I'm not ruling it out. Yeah, and I mean, it's gonna change the way people do clinical research too, in that you have to add to your budgets these devices. And people will say, no, we go low, you know, so Jeffrey, who gave the introductory on what is VR and all that it, for MedVR did a wonderful job of saying, you know, sometimes low tech works, you get the wipes and you can do, you do that kind of thing, but you're going to be held accountable for that as a researcher. So you're going to have to add that into your budget. I know it's already hit well, hard, right? Yeah. So I, the next one um, is, um, I think this is a great one. It's asking about book recommendations. So, you, you know, do you have books that you recommend for learning VR, improving the creativity? Do you have your favorite books that you want to share with the audience? Um, and if not, you know, they can follow you and find out, but did you want to plug a book or anything like that? Um, well, uh, at the end of 2019, myself and Stephen Bouchard uh, edited a, a book. Uh, I can pop it up or you can send me an email and I can send you a link to it, uh, which is an edited edition with about 19 chapters. Um, most of them written by some of the old war horses of VR that have been around, kicking around in the field for a while. So they have a wealth of the past that they bring into the future. Uh, so that might be a good book to pick up. Uh, I can yeah. send some couple chapters, but it covers all the core areas. 
Um, that's a good book. Um, Brendan Spiegel's got a book coming out that's more personal account of um, his journey as a medical doc into the world of VR, where he ties it into philosophy, neuroscience, psychedelics, a real creative book. Of course, Jeremy Balinson's books, uh, Experience on Demand, another good book. I mean, there's a difference between these kind of narratives um, and the handbooks that, you know, you know, walk you through, this is an interface, this is 3D user interface concerns, this is 3D graphics. There's a lot of technical books out there that I think are just as important. Uh, I just don't think so in the chat, they're saying, well, how would I send a note to get that information? So, uh, you know, he's up on his websites as well, but if you want to, you can type your email in there. If, no, if I'm going to type that up right now. Do I be able to get a copy of this stream? Because there's a lot of links that I'm seeing that I want to yep. explore. Uh, I know we get the questions, but I'm pretty sure we can get all of it. And it's also being recorded. The entire video is being recorded even now. So. Um, so then, um, let's see, what are we, what are we doing next? We're getting to the end here. Um, all right. I'm almost like, so stop asking questions, everyone. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Okay. Is it possible to measure patient brain and body response to assist with, uh, best must be best method of delivery of treatment. Um, I, I, I think we already commented about that. I mean, I, we are absolutely doing, starting to do that at the Shriver Center with some of the neuroscientists there. So I can't imagine that you're not having people wearing those hats and tracking what's moving where, but um, maybe you want to talk about that, the measurement between brain body response. So. Yeah. I mean, you know, any, any response we can capture from a person that we can analyze and, correlate or manipulate in some way uh, to improve a treatment effect or improve or change a user experience is going to be relevant. Keep in mind, there's only three things you can measure in a human being. Number one, what they tell you, self-report, which oftentimes is fraught with bias and so forth, um, so impression management. Number two is physiology, um, you know, whether it's EEG, heart rate variability, skin conductance, all that is grist for the mill to inform the impact of a, a, something that goes on in the simulation or to, with big data analytics, start to understand how to adjust the stimulus flow. The third area, which oftentimes is, is less focused on because it's so hard, is measuring behavior, facial expression, right. the content of what someone says, the acoustic properties, what they say, their posture, their gesture. I mean, we've done a lot of research with computer vision, looking at people under psychological distress, interacting with an agent, doing more downward eye gaze, touching their face with their hand more, um, uh, vowel spacing in the acoustic properties of their speech, which may be an indicator. So all of these measures, um, and it, let's not forget um, your Fitbit, your Apple Watch, your what your phone is telling you about how you navigate the world and can that be brought to bear on, on informing an individualized treatment plan. Um, if your phone picks up that you're um, in a bar every night till two in the morning, uh, will your virtual healthcare support agent pop up the next morning uh, at seven o'clock and say, look, right. uh, I've got concerns about your drinking, but I'm more concerned about your sleep deprivation because you're up at seven and you've been going to bed at 2, 33 o'clock. And you snore, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you're quantifying the self in ways that it's up to intelligent people to figure out how to use that stuff um, to inspire or drive the interaction in any kind of a healthcare activity. Um, whether it's yeah, and, and there's components out there now. It used to be that the only way you could track of uh, physical movement was sort of like the connect was so amazing and it still is but um i actually was out there in the at, at an event and i met a company whose name is jumping out of me and i'll have to get that out to people can't think of it right now but you actually could set up your cell phone you could track your track someone with a cell phone app with the camera and it was so specific it was perfect so you could really track like body movement like with a you know really cheap app and then if you tie that, you, you write a little scripting and you tie it into something else. And then the eye tracking in VR now, it can track where your eyes move. You know, the, I know, I know she's here, but the HP, the HP is 
is you know we're all getting excited about the hp headset too right so, you can't say anything we're under an nda but, I, i'm uh, not under an nda i'm just one of uh, waiting for it right so. <laughs> 2021 you're gonna see um some significant advances in uh head mount display sensing yeah, so I can all right let's try and finish up here guys because we're really running late here so um uh, one of them is is this it, what is there a standard for acceptable light levels and light spectrum for a headset display and there's a back and forth between some of the audience underneath this but this was directed at you so i didn't know if you wanted to make a comment on that maybe not not your area or something i think i think I'm, i'd be out of my league uh, yeah. you know spouting off about that um sure. you know, <laughs> mark bolus at microsoft uh yeah, and we've got a good back and forth. And and one of the things we're going to do, so again, we have another talk in two weeks. It's going to be really cool. Um, some of the work that Brandon, you were talking about, Brandon is his partner, and he's one of the speakers in two weeks. Um, but um, so we're going to start a community where we can have ongoing conversations around some of this. So let me move to the next one that's about stroke, PT and for stroke. Um, have you done any work in that area? Do you have tools that you recommend for someone that's at home? Um, and I, I can tell you the whole recommend at home thing like when i give a talk when using my ar for autism people just are coming up to me saying how do i get this for my child for my adult for my and it's just like as a researcher i i haven't put the product out yet so i don't know it's very frustrating uh, to not be able to give them something but do you have something that could be of interest to this person well um you know this is an area we've worked in for a while particularly after the connect came out and uh, we've been working with um, uh, the Leap Motion, which is now Ultra Leap, I believe, uh, where you put the sensor on the headset and you can track your hands and so on. When that stuff can be delivered on a standalone headset, you can send it home to a user. And instead of how we like to play Beat Saber on the, on the Quest, uh, they can do you know, fine motor control, reaction time, all the stuff that will that's one of the areas I want to move forward in, and we're continuing our work with the sensor now that Ultra uh, Ultra Leap, Ultra Haptics have uh, purchased uh, Leap Motion. That's an area that I think um, we'll move forward. There are many companies that are out there now selling rehab tools. Right. They might all be head-mounted display. They may be in front of your TV and. They're tracking your movement in ways like virtual rehab out of Texas. A really yep. good company. Yep. Uh, they're, they're neuroscience informed. Um, you got to be careful. Um, uh, there's probably 10 companies that are producing these things. Of course, Mind Maze, Walter may have talked about them. Um, yep. There's uh, virtual rehab wear out of the Basque region of Spain, I and, believe. And I don't mean to be negative or, or flip about this a little bit, but it's almost like. Um, uh something like vitamins you know like you have to watch out that it isn't uh, clinically tested um but so that's why you look at the science behind these there's about 10 companies that are doing sort of virtual relaxation right now that sh you know might be in this area to help um so that's kind of a you know like buyer beware uh and you got to look at their clinical background um i think the next question i wanted to get to because i as a as I come out of just straight up gaming engineering and all that kind of stuff, someone asked if you have advantages, if you see advantages of utilizing Unity versus Unreal to create VR simulation. So I definitely wanted to talk about this one with you. So uh, do you have a uh, do you have a preference on? And they only listed those two engines. Um, so what's your what say you, Luminary? Well, um, you know we've been using Unity because it's learnable. There are uh, highly learnable. Uh, a lot of high school kids are learning it and building things. And, you know, it's great. I mean, that's what we've been using. However, uh, I've seen some balls out stuff on Unreal uh, and people that master Unreal, they build incredible environments. I mean, so I mean look, I'm not, I'm not gonna do a product pitch for either either. Um, but certainly they're both good game engines. Um, they're good development platforms. Um, I'm not a programmer, so I can't tell you the nuances of them, but they're both good. And it just depends how much money you have or, or your capabilities, your learnability, and the team you have. Uh, I'll work with anything as long as you know we can build cool stuff. 
And the most annoying answer you can give to this one is, is content is king, right? I mean, it's what you put in it. It's, and, and, and those who wield the tool, if they're really good at it, do something amazing, right? So that, so the, those game engines, but I, I can tell you that I use like AAA uh, animation software and I can now capture facial stuff with my iPhone and put it live into Unreal. And yet I use Unity most of the time because it's easier to get people to build in Unity, right? Yeah. So, so it's just, uh, boy, there's a lot of, there's a lot of competition there, but there are other engines besides those two as well, right? So, so yeah, it's, yeah, I was interested in that one. So uh, that's always that holy war. Um, okay, so the next one is, how would you, you broadly assess the effect of gamers with long exposure times uh, on frames per second with high-end graphics as compared to the soldiers that undergo your PTSD treatment? And I felt that you answered that, like you were saying, with short period of times, but do you have more to, to add to that comment? Um, you know, we always do some kind of an evaluation um, as to your gaming history or your hardcore gamer and so forth. Uh, but we've never seen any real solid sledgehammer effects, um, although I think there could be an effect there. Uh, the people that have a long history of games, whether they're more attracted or have more credibility placed in a VR solution for their health care, for their mental health care, because they're at home with that technology. This is a... Um, you know, this is, a, this is an, uh, a sociological area as well as a um, cognitive area, looking at different generations and what have they been exposed to and how does it affect the impact that they get in a VR environment. But, you know, I'll be honest with you, you know, it's a fight and a struggle just to get the money to do a clinical trial that, you know, where you throw everything but the kitchen sink into the uh, application and, get some measurable change in the clinical condition. Now we need to go back and do the dismantling studies. What are the components in, in PTSD? How much does the vibratory stimuli we deliver in a base shaker add to the treatment effect or the use of a scent machine? We use the OVR scent machine, little device that can yep. be affixed to the bottom of the head. Does that scent really matter? We know it's theoretically informed to promote engagement, activate, uh, memory and so forth, <clears throat> but we need to start looking at what are components and what are the personality or user characteristics that might lead a clinician to say, you know what, the traditional method, that's going to work for you, um, or you know what, you're going to love VR, this is a way for you to really engage, unleash that bottled up emotion. Um, we, that's where the, the research is really going to head. We know the sledgehammer effects. We know VR exposure works. We know VR pain distraction works. We know that physical rehab and occupational therapy stuff in a game-based context, we can enhance motivation. You know, it works. We know virtual humans, people are more forthcoming when they're interacting with software, revealing more personal information. We know that, but do we know what elements of the technology and what elements of the user contribute to that? And that's, yep. Yep. these are all empirical questions. Yeah, and I, I think that's, this is exactly the last question to our tied strongly to it, is how important do you think it is to sense body um, or visualize your own body? And and I, I think that last question is sort of in that area, which is very tied to this too, if you if you wanna, if you wanna talk about that at all additionally. So. Um, certainly, uh, look up Mel Slater's work uh, in, in body transfer and all the stuff he's done in that and embodiment. Um, and certainly look at some of the empathy work. I mean, there's one thing that, that brings those two together with Mel's work is where, you know, he's published a couple of studies with uh, spousal abuse where, you know, you have uh, the person who's mandated to get some kind of treatment act out, role play how they might be abusive to their partner or whatever. And then they go in the role of the partner and see themselves in the VR environment um, as a way to both build empathy for the, uh, for the victim uh, from that perspective by the abuser, as well as whatever magic happens when you inhabit the body in terms of uh, beyond empathy, but just in internalizing things that are typically in the abstract mode of reflection but now you're in the trenches in an embodied way. People have been doing this work with Mel 
and Chris Bruin on depression, teaching people self-compassion. Um, was, oh, Dave, the, Mel is a guy I worship because yeah. he's an innovator in this, in this area that goes beyond just simple Skinner box stuff, but really tapping into the brain and body. In a, in I want to give, give a comment on this one, just because um, I'm working with a system now that allows you to embody an avatar that's been pre-recorded to behave a certain way, step right into that, and then uh, turn off, if it's like a two-person interaction or three-person, and then turn off the other scripted one and you can react to it. So maybe you're working with an avatar or you you know, you can shift roles and then you can record live the way you react or the other person reacts and then, then step back and watch an avatar behave the way you just behaved. And so that round, I call it round tripping like that is so powerful. And I'm, I'm working with a prototype in that area now, or actually it's a pilot, it's not a prototype. It's really working on top of a multiplayer unity environment. And it is just so promising, you know, because you can step back and look at how did I behave or someone else behave? And then you can go forward and try to change your behavior a little bit like, and it's live. You immediately see that motion capture deployed onto an avatar while you're still in the 3D location, right? So, so this is right now. Like, I think it's very exciting, especially for spousal of use or anything. Yeah. Hey, let me let me toss one out to your audience and see what they think, um, yeah. uh, if that's possible. Now we're uh, done with questions too, and I'm just gonna remind people two weeks from now and all that, but go ahead, you go. Um, what do people think about the integration of VR, MR, MX, whatever? Um, with psychedelics, do you think there's a future there, or are they two harebrained schemes that, when you bring together, you know, they're they're twice as hard to sell the concept? I'm not sure. I'm I'm, I'm talking with people about this uh, now. Um, I mean, certainly a very delicate area, um, but is there a place for VR as part of uh, some of the the therapy that now there's an emerging scientific literature showing? the value of psychedelic research. Um, it sounds like, so, I, and, and we have that talk coming up in two weeks. And some of that is about, no, not that particular, but I'm sure they'll touch on that a little bit because Brandon and Brendan's work has showed sort of that efficacy lasting longer than, you know, our pain pills. And, and so there's some really interesting stuff like that, but let's see what the, um, the audience says. I'm gonna share the, the upcoming talk, if you don't mind. Um, so that we remind people. Um, that should be. So can you, you can read the chat, right, Skip? Have you seen it? Yeah, interesting. Yeah. All right. So, so folks, you have, would you like to ask the audience anything else, Skip? Are you all? Let me check in with you. All right. So listen, I just want everyone to know how wonderful Skip has been through all of this. I want to remind you that in two weeks, we have a really interesting prototype that's going to be uh, shared with us. And Kate and, and uh, Brandon are both amazing. So I hope that you guys can come. It's two weeks from today at the same time. Uh, we won't have the same audio issues, I hope. Um, and uh, Skip is a, just a hero, right? You're so a, a hero for doing this so much. So. Um, Thank you very much from MedVR. Again, I'm Julie Lemoyne and I'm, I'm uh, so delighted to be the moderator here. So it's been wonderful.